Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to Startup Grind. Thanks for joining us for the final Startup Grind event for 2017. Hopefully you've had a chance to meet some like-minded people and have a drink and some food before we get started. My name is Louisa Dahl. I'm the Chapter Director of Startup Grind in Brisbane. For those of you who don't know, Startup Grind is a global organisation holding over 200 events each month around the world and bringing together like-minded entrepreneurs, founders and startup experts to share their knowledge and experiences with each other. We always start by putting our values on screen and as you'll see here are a few values that Startup Grind like to both live and work by and hopefully you'll all agree that these are great values to uh, start our evening with today. I would like to run through a few housekeeping things before we get to the interview tonight. If anyone needs the bathrooms you need to walk right across the room to the other end and go through the door with the blue sign on it. I'd appreciate it if you can put your phones and devices on silent please for the interview but please do join us on Twitter. Um, we are tweeting from Startup Grind Brisbane with the hashtag Startup Grind. Also, we do have a live Q&A forum here tonight, so if you have any questions that you'd like to ask Mike, we'd love to get your input on the conversation. You can use Slido, so it's the details in red on the slide there. You go to slido.com and the event hashtag to use is Startup Grind BNE. So you can submit your questions that way and we'll do our best to get through them throughout the evening. Now, I would like to take a moment to thank our sponsors this evening as well. We wouldn't be able to hold these events without their support, so we really appreciate it. Google for Entrepreneurs is a global sponsor of Startup Grind. I'd also like to thank Zendesk, the ultimate customer service software. At a local level, I'm super grateful for the support of the following companies, and I ask that you do consider them should you need any services in their field. I'll start with Deloitte. Deloitte work with recognisable startup influencers such as Square Peg Capital, Vinamofo, Aussie Commerce and Hub Coworking. Deloitte help fast growing businesses simplify complexities around their strategy and business model. And next week they're going to be launching their, well, announcing their top 50 fastest growing technology companies around Australia. So keep an eye out for that. It's going to be tweeted and around on media with Tech Fast 50 AU. Clark Can is a commercial law firm with lawyers who live and breathe startups. I want to thank Clark Can lawyers for being supporters of Startup Grind since I started the chapter two years ago. And it's this type of consistency and presence in the startup ecosystem that really highlight what significant contributors they are. So Brad is here tonight. If you'd like an introduction, just let me know. If you're a QUT student, alumni or staff member, the QUT Business School want to hear from you. They're building an entrepreneur research and innovation-led startup culture to support students, alumni and staff to become founders of scalable, globally focused ventures. You can connect with them via QT Foundry or at QT Blue Box today. Now our startup space here, or sorry, our event space I should say, is sponsored by Fishburners. They're Australia's largest community of tech startups and not-for-profit organisation and they support over 300 startups around Australia. Um, there is a one week free trial if anyone is interested in this space upstairs at Fishburners, so check out their website for more details. And I'd also like to give a big thanks to Terry at Take Two Productions, who is here again tonight and every event that we run, um, diligently videoing for us. So if you're after great quality video and anything you're doing, I can highly recommend Terry. And now I'd like to get started with the most exciting part of the evening and introduce our guest. Mike Knapp started off as a lawyer before joining Google as a software engineer. In 2009, he was a co-founder of the Design Your Own Shoe Company, Shoes of Prey, who's a well-known and respected Australian startup, receiving over $25 million in, in funding and expanding internationally. Mike's now moved on from Shoes of Prey and is back in Brisbane working with local startups. And I've been looking forward to interviewing him for some months. I'd like you to join me in the startup grind fashion and rise to your feet and give Mike a round of applause. Welcome, Mike. <laughs> Hello. Lisa. Standing to the feet, that's, that's something new. <laughs> that's right, it's a start-up gun way. Wow. And we're on a stage tonight just to mix it up, so hopefully you can all see us really well this evening. Now, as you know, no two entrepreneurial journeys are the same, so we're really keen to hear off how yours started and, and where it all began. <laughs> so I understand you started with law and computer science at UQ here in Brisbane. Yeah, I, I did. Actually, my mother reminds me, my first entrepreneurial journey was when I was in primary school and I was selling scrunchies to all the girls <laughs> at the school. Little did I know I'd go on to yeah, have a yeah, shoe company. In that. <laughs> um, but yeah, Michael, Jody, uh, and I uh, started Choose a Prey. And, but before we did that, there was actually a whole bunch of stuff that we did together sort of for many years. So we were at 
uh, university, all studying law. Jodie was at Griffith and we were at UQ. And Michael and Jodie got to know each other and uh, got married at some point. And we were just mucking around with all these different ideas. So we had a, a, this terrible dating website uh, concept that we were just sort of experimenting with buzz marketing. Uh, and then we also had a, another website where we were learning about um, tour guides, like you know, how to sort of go to a city. And, and, and so it was like a, a, an early trip advisor. Um, yeah, and, then, and we decided we were going to do uh, something together, something bigger, but we wanted to go and work for another company for a while. Um, so Michael and I went to Google and Jody did advertising and then we saved up as much money as we could and then uh, launched Choose a Prey four years later. So you mentioned before a pact. Can you tell us about that pact? Yeah, so we, we, we said let's let's go and uh, save as much money as we can. I think this mic, is this mic working? Yeah, it is if you hold it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, let's save as much money as we can, and then um, four years to the day, uh, we'll start a company. And in and and four years to the day, we, we started She's a Prey. And we'd actually uh, brainstormed a whole bunch of different ideas, and uh, She's a Prey was at the top. And we sort of naively thought, like, let's just do all of them. Like, <laughs> there's actually an email where I, I was like, I think I'll be all done with She's a Prey in about three months, and then with the coding, and I can move on to the next business. <laughs> And of course, it doesn't work like that. Like, you know, <laughs> Several years later. Yeah. So, can you tell us any of the other business ideas that are on that list? Do you remember? Yeah, there were there were weird ones like uh, like a scuba diving community organization and all kinds of things. So, um, we really had no idea what we were doing, and I think we got a little bit lucky with the shoes of prey idea. Um, there were some really bad other ideas that we <laughs> we could have, you know, done. So, yeah. So, how did you go from law to Google? Like. That's a bit of an unusual step in itself. Yeah, I, I was really, I always thought I would be a lawyer. And I remember the first day of law school, uh, the, the first lecture, uh, Mrs. Black, I remember her name. <laughs> she, she, she said, you know, look around, most of you won't become lawyers. And I was like, great, more, you know, more work for me. <laughs> um, I was so determined to be a lawyer. And then I, after I graduated, I went and worked with a judge here in Brisbane in the district court as an associate. And I really loved that. But I just realized straight away, this, this wasn't my passion. My passion was computers and the internet and like how do we build a big business? And so I, I left and I went back to, I turned down a job at Minter Ellison's and went back and moved in with my parents again, which is kind of a common theme in my story. <laughs> and uh, it happens multiple times. And, um, and I created this like web design company, which was pretty terrible. I was making relatively good money, but it was really lonely. So I was like, I need to go and work for someone else. So I went and worked at Google. Uh, for four As years. you do. Yeah. And were you one of the early employees in Australia at Google? Yeah, a uh, number about 14 in Australia. So it was really, it felt like a startup back then. So it was like the Google Maps guys, because Google Maps is in a, was an Australian product originally. So it was them, which was pretty cool to be in the same sort of office space as them. And then, you know, a few salespeople. So we were really making it up as we went along. Um, and I would often, I, I went to California for a while and I was in the Mountain View office and I'd ring up Australian businesses. And I'd say, hi, it's Mike from Google. And they're like, no, it's not. <laughs> I'm like, no, really, it's Mike from Google. <laughs> Mike, I'm going to swap microphones with you just in okay. case that one's any better for you. OK. OK, so Choose a Prey came about. You had this idea. Yep. You decided you had it packed and you had some money saved. Yep. How much like runway did you have in terms of savings to, like, what, was the, what were your initial thoughts when you started? We had um, about. We, we went for about three and a half years before we had to raise money. And we actually hadn't really depleted our savings that much, which is the good news, because we were running the business at close to break even. So that was, that was really good. Um, actually, I think I've often said, like, you should have a lot of money in the bank before you start a business. And I think that's, that's always a nice to have. But actually, I think I'm starting to change my, my idea around that. I think, actually, you want to attack a really important painful problem more than you want to have lots of money in the bank. Because having lots of money in the bank is like a safety blanket. Mm. And you can just go for too long working on something that's a little bit crazy. So you need um, to be hungry to like, you know, survive. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And I painfully have learned this lesson again. Uh, and made all the amateur mistakes again this year, trying to launch my new thing called Mottle, um, where I sort of quite arrogantly thought, I'm just going to build this like, incredible thing, and then they'll come. Having like not learned anything from eight years of <laughs> Choose a Prey. And I've come, I just painfully came to the realization like, oh my God, I'm, I've just made all the amateur mistakes myself again. 
We weren't going to talk about model to the end, but we can totally talk about that now and yep. just mix things up for you. So tell us what was the concept behind model and what was your realization recently? So, well, I guess to tell that story, I need to say the reason I left Shoes of Prey is after eight years, I'd worked on really interesting problems. So building the factory in China, I lived in China for three years, um, building the shoe factory and then um, also all the tech, you know, that goes into the, the workflow if you go to the... And we are totally going to come back and talk about all that. Yeah. <laughs> but I realized I wasn't really that passionate about women's shoes. Um, <laughs> and never was. Like, I was excited about technology. And I don't know how to use a microphone, I'm realizing as well. <laughs> I'm just totally failing at the moment. Um, oh, good. So I, I was really excited about technology and working with Michael and Jody on the business. But, like, I just didn't have a, a, a passion for the core problem we were trying to solve. Um, like making incrementally more beautiful shoes for women just is not really part of my DNA. And so after eight years, I was it is like, now. yeah, <laughs> I know a scary amount of women about women's shoes now, but, um, I just really wasn't driving me forward. And so I had to, had to go do something else. And so I went on this, uh, trip across America, uh, on a train for four days. And so one, one side of America to the other. And um, they make you eat with other passengers. So you sit down and have a conversation. The first time I went to have a, a meal, they said, oh, you've got to eat with this elderly couple. And there was no one else sitting in the, in the car. So I, I, I go to ha you know, sit down, and there's, the guy stands up and goes, I'm sorry, we don't want to eat with you. It was like, really awkward. <laughs> it was supposed to build, it was supposed to be like a community building kind of exercise. And so um, that was really awkward. Um, but I sat down and we ended up having a really amazing conversation and it was sort of one of those life affirming moments where you're like, wow, it's so, it's so awesome to talk to a human being. Like I haven't done that enough, you know, for no, there's no business purpose. It's just like, you know, a conversation. And, and then I was like, I need more of that in my life. And so yeah, that sort of set off a chain reaction of me thinking that there was a real problem around conversation and maybe there is, but, um, I ended up building this product and then like pivoting twice, um, sort of not really going and doing enough customer research and just all the basic stuff that you're supposed to do. So what now? Or is that fresh? <laughs> uh, yeah, it's pretty fresh. But I'm, I'm actually, I've met another guy and he's working on a very similar problem, uh, but in a different space. And maybe we can work together somehow. We'll see. Uh, I'm not sure. But I've also enjoyed uh, teaching other startups. So I'm part of the RCL Accelerator at the moment and doing some courses. And it's just really fun to go and help people and, I guess, say, you know, you're not alone. Like, these are common things that, you, that everyone goes through when you, you run a startup. Um, so that's nice. Yeah, definitely. So let me just jump around a little bit here because you've spoken about a few, few things I want to delve into a bit. So one of the important things I think you mentioned is about working on things that you're passionate about. Yep. And obviously in the early days, the technology excitement got you through yep. um, until you realised that that wasn't enough any longer term. So yeah. what kind of lessons did you pass on to other startups around that that you can kind of have in hindsight now? Um, one exercise I get people to do is to list all of their personal values, um, which is a really interesting exercise. I remember early on in Choose a Prey, an investor advised us to do that. And I, was, I remember thinking, I don't have any personal values. <laughs> like I was so naive and green, I didn't even know what that meant. And of course I did, I just didn't know how to express it or you know, where you even begin. Um, and I think, so that then leads you to sort of your why, the Simon Sinek, you know, what is your why, what's your purpose? Um, and so I think from those things, you can, you can then sort of find an area that you're interested in, not necessarily a, a problem. And then you need to go and really kind of research and really find painful problems that people want solutions to, rather than sort of intellectual uh, problems that you just sort of constructed in your mind, which is completely how I came, arrived at model, and I thought I was really clever for doing it. But actually, I wasn't solving a real problem. I was just, you know, mucking around by Crazy myself. Stuff. <laughs> yeah, in my so head. So now that you've reflected on that a little bit, is that something you'd be willing to share with us in terms of some of your values or your why? Yeah. So my the way I actually arrived at Model was I was thinking a lot about the future and um, technology and you know artificial intelligence and robotics. Um, we're sort of moving towards um, a version of the future where humans sort of take. Uh, on another role in society, and I'm not sure what that looks like. And I thought, like, I've got the skills to actually go and work on all that AI stuff, but um, actually what's really more interesting is the people side of things. Like, what do we all do, you know, when all of the robots take our jobs? And I got a little bit too carried away with this idea, like, I need to, like, create a platform for people to talk to each other because, like, we're going to lose our jobs to robots. Like, I'm thinking, like, too far 
ahead about something that's not actually a problem today. And so, um, and, and, and books like uh, Zero to One, you know, Peter Thiel, where he talks about what's oh, a secret no one knows, like those things actually don't help because you get too sort of caught up in the intellectual exercise of like, let's invent something that doesn't exist, um, which is actually not a good way to discover a startup. A good way to discover a startup is actually find a real painful problem right now with customers that are willing to give you money today. Uh, so I've just discovered that you know, painfully this, this year. I did learn how to develop mobile apps, though, so that was kind of, that was kind of fun. <laughs> Definitely always learning along the way. Yeah. And is there an approach that you would recommend now for startups to use in that kind of early phase of um, validation, I suppose, and problem identification? Yes. Uh, there's an excellent book called Running Lean. Uh, who's read Running Lean? Anyone? Mm. No, this is, this is the book. If you're, if you're kind of working on a startup right now, uh, read Running Lean. And it talks about the lean canvas, which you may have encountered. So it's um, a really good way to narrow in on problems and customers and unique value propositions. Uh, and then it tells you how to go and test that in the real world. So go and how to actually go and have a conversation with someone and verify that what you're about to embark on is actually a real problem in the world and not just sort of a, a contrived. And the, thing, the great thing is that you find a really painful problem uh, the customers will just rip the solution out of you. You don't even need to worry. So was, we, we tend to just skip straight to the solution, like what is the solution? Oh, it's an app, da, 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 da. but actually we get blindsided by the solution. We don't actually think about, does this solve a painful problem? Like if taxis, if taxis didn't suck, you know, Uber wouldn't probably have the ability to, to come into the world. Yeah, it's a really, you know, it's, it's somewhat obvious, but it's really important to stop and actually think it through in that context, because I think it's really easy to justify to ourselves as founders that what we're doing is important. Yep. So having that kind of process and, and something to follow definitely, I think, adds value. Yep. Awesome. Now, look, I have completely stuffed up the order of my <laughs> questions tonight, so you're just going to have to bear with me. I'm going to jump around a little bit, and we're going to go back to Shoes of Prey Days, because I know <laughs> most people in this room would have heard quite a lot about it, but I think... There's still some, you know, key milestones I want to cover off with you. Yep. Can you walk us through, you know, some of the, the key things that stand out for you in the period that you were involved in the business and, you know, both good and bad? Share some of those stories with us. Yeah, so there, there was a period of about three or four years uh, was sort of where we were just like wandering aimlessly in the desert uh, because we didn't know what we were doing. We didn't have the right tools. There wasn't, you know, startups weren't really a thing um, back then and at least in Australia. So there weren't, you know, great investment firms. There weren't, you know, co-working spaces. You know, it was really just like occasionally you'd get, go to a meetup and it would be like three dodgy guys in a in a pub. Um, <laughs> so we were really on our own, um, and we didn't have any idea. We didn't have any tools. Like, you know, there's so many great tools and resources out there today. Um, so we really didn't know what we were doing, and we en ended up wasting a lot of time. Um, which is why actually I'm excited to get part to be part of the accelerator at, at RCL because I actually think those programs really do help you because they just skip a whole bunch of steps that you know would otherwise take you years like banging your head against the wall. You eventually work all those things out, but it just costs you a huge amount of money and time. Um, so yeah, there was a whole bunch of time where we were just learning and just like failing a lot uh, and getting no attention and doing things like going to the Bondi markets to sell our shoes, you know, which is a good way to learn, actually. Um, but yeah, lots of learning and lots of mistakes. Um, and slowly building, you know, step by step. And then eventually we, we got funding um, and then the business took a sort of different trajectory after that. When was the first round of funding? And how much was that? Who with? Uh, it was about $3 million in 2010 um, with um, a whole group of people. Mike Cannon-Brooks was one of the, so he's the, CEO of Atlassian. He was the first person to get really excited about the business because um, he's, he's quite cool. And uh, his wife also uh, is cool and she works in fashion. And so she was like, oh, this is an interesting company. So having Mike on board was really great because um, then all the other investors sort of folded at that point, came in into the round. Um, and Mike, at that point, we had another business as well called Sneaking Duck, um, which we're still sort of involved in, which is a glasses company. And it was sort of a Warby Parker uh, of Australia. And Mike... Is that still around? It's still, it's still going. Yeah. But Mike was quite helpful because he said... Because we had this idea we're going to have all these different businesses. And Mike said, I'll only invest in you if you get rid of... Or you stop working on Sneaking Duck. Um, and at the time, we thought, 
no way, because you know, there's all these synergies, we use the same warehouse, it's the same back end, it's the same marketing team. Um, we didn't really get it. And then he said, I'd rather have be an investor in one really great business and two really mediocre ones. And he was so he was so spot on looking back, I was like, you know, it was a great, a great piece of advice. So yeah, for all of you that are trying to do like three things, like try to uh, go back to your best idea and just work on one and make it really good. Um, so that that was helpful. I forget where I was going. No, that's that's all good. That makes sense. Yeah. Um, and look, I mean, this was a really unique business model, particularly back when you started doing the idea of doing on-demand bespoke design yeah. for products. Like, were there many times that you went, "This is ridiculous. Like, why are we trying to do this?" Yeah, yeah, like every day. <laughs> uh, so because um, we also had to create our own factory to do it, um, because no other factory could can handle the complexity of one by one manufacturing. Um, so that involved you know, hiring hundreds of people in China and me being the, the person who owned the company um, in China, and, like, which is very stressful. Uh, and you know, having to learn how to make shoes and all this sort of stuff. Like it was what we, were tried, what we have attempted and pulled off with Shoes of Prey is ridiculously crazy. Um, and you know, I, looking back at it, I'm very proud, but at the same time, it was like a lot of hard work. And, you know, it was, yeah, it was a very stressful part of, part of my life. So you got the job of going to China and setting up the factory there. What was, like, obviously you hadn't had experience in that before, so what was that process like for you and what were the key learnings? Yeah, it was really fun. I mean, I said it was really stressful, but it was really fun. And it wasn't just me, it was a, a team of people. So uh, my brother, uh, there's another guy, Brendan, who's from Brisbane. Um, uh, there's now another guy from Brisbane, uh, Chris, uh, uh, who's over there. And so we had a really great team. I think the one thing we realized early on is we have to be in China. We have to send people to be on the ground because um, it's just impossible to do it all by email. So we got that right. But um, yeah, it was really fun. I mean, we had all kinds of you know, weird and wonderful things happen to us uh, in China. There's actually, if you're making things in China, there's a really good book called Poorly Made in China. And I feel that book is like a biography, even though it's not about me. Uh, the author never met me, but like everything in that book has happened to me, you know, one way or the other. Awesome. Mm. And if someone here is looking to set up a factory in China, apart from going there and being on the ground, what other tips or advice would you pass on? Uh, go to the Guangzhou Fair, uh, which is a big fair that happens multiple times per year, and they have all the factories in China coming uh, to pitch their stuff. So it's a really easy way. Guangzhou is a, a beautiful city too, very uh, nice place to be. So yeah, that's a, that's a good place to go and dip your toe in the water. But you have to go. You can't. I, I think if you want to really do business in China, you've got to go and and look at people and shake their hand and give the, your business card. Were there many options for you to consider when you were setting up over there? given that you, you know, have a bespoke product? Uh, yeah, I mean, pe there were people that were very interested, and also the GFC was happening around the time we, we opened, so people were uh, happy to work with us and just sort of keen for the business. But as we grew, we got to a point where they just couldn't, they couldn't do it anymore, so we had to uh, take over, which is you know, why we had to open the factory, which was good fun. Yeah, right. Yeah. What role did customer research play in your business? You mentioned already you spent some time at the markets. You know, beyond that, what role did it play and was that significant for you? When we first started the company, we um, got the, the women of Google to buy shoes from us at half price. Um, and actually looking back on it, I wish we hadn't given them a discount uh, <laughs> because giving a discount uh, is giving yourself a free pass on your validation. So you know, try, to, try to charge at full price. Um, but really, we didn't do enough, and we weren't good at listening to customers in the early years. I think, yeah, the ability to listen, not just to customers, but to staff members and, and board members, like that's a skill that takes years to develop, and I'm, I'm still not the best at it. Um, but yeah, really listening, I think, is a really key important point. We really didn't know much about customer validation, and to sort of go back to what I was saying earlier, like really, you want to look for really painful problems that you want to solve, and the customer should be ripping out their wallet there and then and saying, how much does this cost? I, write, I don't need this right now. And sometimes it's not about changing the product, it's about changing the way you describe the problem, if that makes sense. Because we, we all have very important problems, but sometimes it takes something to, for us to realize we actually have that problem. If someone in the room here is going, oh, I need to do some customer validation, 
What, how should they start? What do you recommend? Uh, the way we did it at She's a Prey towards the end, uh, and I'm really embarrassed that it took us sort of seven years to do this, but I used to put an ad up on uh, Craigslist and I'd say 140 bucks an hour. I want to I want to talk to you about women's shoes, and then we'd get um, people we get sort of 600 people applying, and then I'd ask a whole bunch of questions and I'd say I want you know I want these three people, and you don't need this is not this is not about statistics. This is just about getting validation or getting some raw response. So I'd get the three people coming into the office, and I'd get them set up in a conference room with a computer uh, with WebEx broadcasting to the boardroom where everyone else, all the developers and the product managers and the designer, the CEO, everyone's there. And you just watch what happens. You have a neutral, uh, neutral facilitator and they just walk through a whole bunch of things like, you know, can you tell me what this website is? And it's mind blowing that like, people were like, I think it's a shoe site. <laughs> and you're like, what? <laughs> what else could it be? <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, but it's not their fault, like they just, they just they're just yeah. telling you what they see, but you're, you get so caught up in the context that's in your head, which is not right, um, that you, you don't, you lose touch with the customer, right? So being able to do that is really, really important. Is, is like three people enough to validate in that way? Or is that something you did kind of ongoing and regularly? You, you see it, if everyone says the same thing, even if it's just three people, you're like, oh, there's a problem here. You know, it shouldn't, it shouldn't be that hard. You know, there are certain companies that do this really well. Um, like I think Stripe is a, just a brilliant example of a company that really understands its value proposition and its customer. Its customer is not the CFO, which is unusual for a payments company. Their customer is the developer. And if you go to the, the Stripe website, the second item in the menu is developers. So it's products and then developers. And the, the unique value proposition is just honed in on the uh, developer. And they know that the developer will go, this is what we're implementing because it's so easy and so beautiful. Like our, our engineers fought each other to implement Stripe. <laughs> you know, that's, that's how incredible and how powerful, like this is a payment company, like who, who gets excited about payments? No one. But if you're a Stripe customer, you do. You know, so that's a really great example, I think, of someone who understands the customer and has developed a product to really address that. Nice, nice. Can you tell us uh, one of the low points throughout your Shoes of Prey journey where you thought you were going to fail and what you did to turn it around? Oh, so many to choose from. <laughs> uh, there were lots of moments and I think actually, I'm going to try and move, I just wonder if it's the, the mic. Uh, the it's wild. okay. You can hear me? Yeah. Um, I think actually the other thing I've learned this year is that uh, having co-founders is really important um, because there's lots of moments where you want to quit and so Michael and Jody are two really great co-founders um, and so there are lots of times when I personally wanted to get off the bus and other, other times where they may have wanted to get off the bus as well, um, but you sort of rally together and, and work through it. Um, but yeah, there's, I mean, there's lots of hard times. There's, you know, that, you know, when you can't raise money, when you've got to, you've got to, you can't make payroll this, this month and you've got to you know, pay money out of your own bank account. Um, or you might get a string of you know, bad customer complaints uh, and you think, you know, oh, is this, is this worth it? Or in the early days, it was, you know, we would get uh, multiple days where no one would buy any shoes. And this might be like a year or two in, and you're like, oh, it's all over, like, what's happened, you know? But it's not, it's not really about those moments, about, it's about what you do tomorrow to sort of address it. Um, so if you've got a great team and you've got a good vision, uh, now vision, actually, just on that point, vision and mission are really, really important. So if you know, uh, my, my classic example is SpaceX. So their vision is to live, for humans to live on other planets, which is just such a you know, motivating vision of the future. And their mission is we're gonna revolutionize space technology. So it's very clear, you know, what, if you're an employee, what the goal is, and it's, which is really motivating. And you know, what I can do to contribute to that, I need to revolutionize space technology. Uh, and actually, the way they do that at the office at SpaceX is really cool. They have a picture of, of two planets. It's actually, they're both Mars. Uh, the first is Mars today, so the red barren planet. And the other is Mars once it's been terraformed to sort of look like Earth. And that's, that's all you need, really. It's just so motivating. It's so like, that's, that's the vision I want to work towards. And so, you know, ups and downs, you know, you might miss a, you know, a launch or something or, 
you know, you miss funding, but you've got that vision. That's, you know, that's where we're heading. That's a very literal vision as well, which is definitely yeah. helpful. What was your vision at Shoes of Prey? Uh, we, it's changed a little bit uh, over, over the years. So it was to sort of bring happiness to customers through uh, the power of developing their individuality through fashion. Um, and, and yeah, that's just not a vision that I was particularly personally pa pa uh, passionate about, but there are lots of people on the team that were. Um, so it was, you know, I want to bring them down, right? So you've got to go and find something else that you're personally passionate about. But I think it's really cool. And the one thing I do love about Shoes of Prey is this idea that we're going to revolutionize um, the technology of making shoes. Um, so be it sort of vegan shoes that look and feel like real leather. Um, and also being able to sort of robotically create a shoe so that we don't have you know, piles of stock in a warehouse that have to get discounted or you know, destroyed. Um, I think that's really cool. So there's an environmental aspect and that. I get really passionate about that. Um, but yeah, the, 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 the fashion aspect isn't something that personally resonates with me. Fair enough. <laughs> yeah. Tell us about um, the move to the US because a lot of your team moved over at one point. So what was the, the catalyst for that and how yeah. did that you know, come about? So that was because um, our investors required it. So once you take money from big Silicon Valley investors, they want you to be really close so they can get on a plane and come down and talk to you. Uh, so that was, that was the main reason. Um, I think in retrospect, I would, I would, if I had the choice, I would try not to do that again um, because moving the team is really disruptive. And it ends up costing you a huge amount of you know, money. Did the whole team move? Yeah, yeah. So we had 25 people in Sydney and 23 of them moved. Wow. Um, which is pretty amazing. Four, four people got married so they could bring their partners with them, <laughs> which is like the <laughs> ultimate dedication. So that's, I mean, that's one thing that we did really well at Choose a Prey is developing a really incredible culture so that people really felt connected to the company and, and really you know, were very passionate about what we did. So that was a big win. So what were your key learnings in moving, you know, an Aussie team over to the US and how did that kind of impact culturally and also their performance? Uh, well, when I left uh, sort of at the beginning of this year, not much had changed actually. It was, I mean, it was a lot of Australians living in Santa Monica in Los Angeles, which is a nice place in the world to live. Um, but we were relatively insular and we hadn't at that stage um, hired a huge number of Americans. So it was, it was still very much had our Australian culture. Um, but that's a bit of a problem too, because you really want to integrate into the local environment. So we were hiring, trying to hire more uh, local people. Um, but yeah, we, were, we are also an Australian company originally, so we want to retain that sort of Australianness as well. Were there many other companies that you were aware of that had moved like entire teams like that? Because that's got to be fairly unusual. Yeah, I think it does happen. Like, um, but usually it's not like the whole Mm. whole head office moves like it might be like oh who would like to go to yeah. silicon valley not like everyone's got to move in three weeks um and <laughs> actually quick. <laughs> some people told us that you know if an office moves from one side of los angeles to the other everyone will quit because they just can't well. they can't do the commute so it's like we were asking people to move from one side <laughs> of the world slightly to the other. bigger than that yeah <laughs> wow and tell us about your so you're talking about nordstrom in terms of the investor that got involved can you tell us a little bit about that experience working with them um, I know there's been some trial and error and changes around that as well, so maybe take us through the highlights of that. Yeah, I, so actually it wasn't Nordstrom, it was um, Coastal Ventures that was yeah. the, the main the lead one that asked us to move. But mm -hmm. yeah, getting Nordstrom on board was really great. Uh, and it was a real coup for us to actually um, have them invest in the company because uh, their whole thing is shoes. They're just they're all about shoes. and. Um, yeah, the way we pitched them was actually really funny. It was like, ended up being just like a twenty-minute meeting, and we had no slides, and uh, we just we just talked all about them. We were just like, you you know, you're a wonderful company, but you've got all these problems, and we're going to solve solve them for you. Um, and you know, fortunately, they they took us on board, which was great. Um, but I think the other thing is we we weren't great at physical retail um, ourselves, so it was a really steep learning curve for us. Um, and I think we'll probably try to attack it again, but we had to end up closing down the stores because we were, end up doing, we were doing too much stuff. We just moved the office from one side of the world to the other. We were just ramping up our factory. We we're trying to get our, you know, our brand done and our website, and we also got all these stores with a really tiny team. So it was, it was just a matter of like doing too much at once um, and not being focused enough. 
but they were still really good. Like they're still an investor, and um, I think we still sell shoes through their website, and they still process all our returns for us and sell them in their rack. So they're still a great partner, and hopefully we can mm. pick that up again. So you think down the track there will be more retail, in-store, you know, opportunities? I, I hope so. We'll see. we'll see if it makes sense. I guess. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Interesting. I'm uh, trying to incorporate a few other questions here as we go as well. Um, a random one while we're talking about the US. What's the AI scene like in the US compared to here? And the technology, I suppose, as a whole? Yeah, it's a good question. I, I'm probably not the best person to ask. Uh, I'm, I'm still, yeah, so so caught up in, I guess, the fashion world when I was there, um, the fashion tech. But I mean, you know, places like Google obviously are very inspiring with all the work that they're doing uh, in AI, but I'm, I'm probably not the best person to ask. Yeah. Fair enough. We'll ask yeah. you down the track. Yeah. <laughs> Tell us about leaving Shoes of Prey. I mean, obviously that must have been a pretty massive decision for you, even though you had identified that wasn't, you know, somewhere where your passion was going to be lying moving forward. How did that come about and, and what did that mean? Uh, it wasn't uh, a, a quick decision, so it took a long time and it took a long time to find my replacement as well. It wasn't the case, I just ran out the door and said, good luck, okay. It took about two years to actually hire my replacement um, and it was quite, quite difficult to find the right person that's going to take the team uh, forward. What was your role when you before you left? Uh, so I was looking at the fact, I was kind of in a jack of all trades uh, kind of role, but actually we also hired a whole bunch of other people to do it. So I felt like I was kind of managing managers and not really getting to do the fun stuff, which is kind of the, the implementation and the work. So that's, that's another thing that happens as your startup gets bigger is, you end up not doing the technical skill that you potentially really enjoy. So if you're a computer programmer or a designer, you know, within a few years, you're not doing that anymore. You're managing a team of people. And that can be a real challenge. Um, and there's a, there's a really great book about that phenomenon, um, um, the e-myth, that's right, where they talk about, you know, a lot of technical people start companies and then they realize they actually don't have the skills or the interest to actually run the company. They just want to go back to the technical skills. So, that's a, that certainly happened to me. Like I, I really love writing code and being close to sort of the, the problems um, at the sort of the coal face, but I don't really love being sort of in the management and sort of filling out KPI reports and things like that. Fair enough. Yeah. And so when you then decided to leave, were you always going to come back to Australia? Yeah, uh, that was the plan. And um, I went to Japan for a while, for three months. Um, and that was really, really great. Hang out, I uh, was at a co-working space there uh, and eating lots of sushi, which I enjoyed. And then I was gonna come back and visit my parents for a little bit and then move to Sydney. But I was here for like a two or three weeks and did a tour of RCL and I was like, wow, this is really cool. And they're like, do you wanna be an entrepreneur in residence? I was like, yeah, that sounds really fun. And so Brisbane's changed a lot since like I last lived here 12 years ago. So it's it was nice to be back and um, I think I'm going to stick around for at least another few more months and see what happens. Yeah, you would have noticed a massive difference in the ecosystem and the yeah. environment in Brisbane. Yeah, in massive. The space. Yeah, very exciting. Yeah, great. How do you think, are you up to speed with the startup ecosystems in other cities in Australia like in Sydney or Melbourne? Oh, I mean a little bit in Sydney, but yeah. How does it compare now to you know how Brisbane's tracking? Uh, well, I mean I think Brisbane's still up and coming. I mean, you know, Sydney is much more developed and, and they say Melbourne's similar, but um, I'm really impressed with Brisbane. I think there's a really uh, great uh, community here. And also I think I just really enjoy Brisbane people. I think there's, like a, there's definitely a different culture of, mm. of person in Brisbane. And so I'm really enjoying being back. So yeah, keep, keep doing what you're doing in Brisbane. It's, it's great. It's friendlier. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yep. How has your lifestyle and habits changed since leaving Shoes of Prey? I mean, that must have been a massive kind of relief after years of, mm. you know, hard entrepreneur work. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's changed a lot. So I guess I don't have to do all the management stuff I, I wasn't enjoying. Uh, but, you know, I think it's harder to hold yourself accountable when it's just you. Uh, and I actually really miss, this is another line, I really miss being around people. Um, so it's nice to go into RCL at least once a week. Um, I think, yeah, a company is really a group of people and the idea that you can be a sole founder, I'm meeting more and more sole founders and, and I'm, I'm just starting to realize that that's a complete mistake. Like you can't build a company with one person. It's just not possible. 
did you ever consider not going straight into another starter? Was there any other any, any other option? Uh, no. <laughs> I mean, the idea you could go and work for someone is kind of it, you know once you've been an entrepreneur for eight years, like it's I don't know if I could do that. Like turn up on day one and like. <laughs> Uh, here's where the bathrooms are. And, be exciting for like two you know, weeks, I think, wouldn't it? Yeah, getting a paycheck <laughs> would be cool, but yeah, that's about it. So, so what now? You're you're an entrepreneur in residence at RCL. What does that mean day to day? So we have ten companies that uh, are going through the accelerator program for six months, and they get sixty thousand dollars in investment. And then the entrepreneurs in residence, there's two of us, there's Lou Jury and myself. Um, we we're, we're there one day a week each, and we coach the teams and there's some other people on the delivery team as well. There's another um, experienced entrepreneur who's really amazing, uh, Christo, and so he'll, he'll work for the teams and then there's all the other people at RCL as well. So we, we, we're just trying to really advise companies so that they can miss all of the, the potholes that we've, we've all hit in our experience and sort of speed you up, get you to the good bit. Can you tell us about any of the, the companies in that accelerator that you're excited about? Uh, yeah, there's, I mean, there's, so, there's, there's quite a few. I probably won't, I won't name them individually, but yeah, there's some exciting companies. I was like really, I was really impressed. But the thing is like, you know, when you see a pitch, everything looks really great, you know, and glossy. And then under, under the surface, there's lots of, you know, <laughs> legs paddling furiously. So, um, you know, I don't think any of the companies are a complete home run yet, but you know, there's some really great teams and really great people. And I'm excited to see what will happen next. Are you seeing any common mistakes or things that founders perhaps should be doing differently consistently amongst these teams? Uh, I think it's coming I, now. I mean, you know, once you've got a hammer, like everything looks like a nail, I guess. But like, I, I, I come back to that, that thing is like, are you solving a really painful problem? Um, I'm just completely obsessed about that idea at the moment. And it's interesting, like, if you look at a lot of startups and you ask that question, a lot of people are like, oh, no, but the solution's great. Like, <laughs> And, and people will eventually, it was like, no, nah, you, you've really got to be obsessed about, is this a painful problem? Is it worth solving? Because it's a problem that you're going to work on for 10 years of your life. Uh, and for me, like, I'm just not that interested in solving the problem of women's shoes. So I had to leave. But, you know, are you, are you really passionate about your startup, the problem that you're going to, you're going to attempt to solve? When you walked away from Shoes of Prey and you think back, and I suppose you're sharing your story a lot now, problem identification and that vision of being things that have been consistently brought up tonight, are there any other kind of really key things that you look back on and go, I would do that differently or I'd recommend that other companies, you know, take the shortcut route? I think the, the big one is um, hiring experts and having expertise in the business. So. You know, we didn't hire a really senior shoemaker until like three years ago. Mm. It was embarrassing because we like, that was a core product. Um, so sort of, I think being really naive about what you can accomplish is, is cute. But, you know, if you want to be a serious company, you have to go and get the best resources. So if it's that you're making shoes, you need to go and find the best people that can make shoes and the best equipment and the best tools and the best methodology. You can't sort of just go, oh, we'll work it out. In, six years time. Um, so I, I would do that very differently. Like if I had to start Shoes of Prey again today, it would be a much faster process <laughs> because I just cut out years of just wasted wasted effort and going around in circles. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Actually, can I add one more thing? So Please. the other thing is um, learning to run a company professionally. So I think in startups, we often think that we get a free pass because we're a startup and we don't have to do all the things that a regular company does. And that's true to an extent, but it actually can be quite destructive if you're not clear with your staff about what the plan is or what the, you know, like, do you have a HR policy? Like, um, and it doesn't have to be the best in the world, but you have to have something. Um, and the way you communicate what you're working on, what the goals are, what the targets are, who's responsible for what, who makes what decision. Like in startups, you know, we, it took us years to figure out actually how to do that. Um, and now that we know how to do it, we're a lot better executors for that. Um, but yeah, I think knowing how to run a company is something, is it's an undervalued skill in, in the startup world. And if someone doesn't have that experience, what should they do to get it? Uh, take my course. Uh, <laughs> no, I think... I said that uh, really a, well, did you see that? Yeah, that's great. <laughs> uh, there's a really good book called um, uh, High Output Management by Andy Grove from Intel. And he talks a lot about, it's a very practical book, so just read that and you'll know the answer. Um, 
and they actually applied that at Google, and I didn't realize it until I read Andy's book, and I was like, oh, I've seen all this before, like almost word for word. Um, so he was the CEO of Intel, I might mention that. So that's a really great book, just read that, that has the, that has the formula. Yeah, I, um, I must admit, I've been in the startup space for a decade or so myself now, and it's only recently I've got a business coach and started going through some of this stuff, and I'm like, what was I doing all these years? Like, really, there's so much information yeah. that's come out of that that's just been changing, you know, it can change the whole landscape. Mm. Um, so, yeah, I can totally see the value in, you know, even getting that other perspective and mm. being a bit more formal with how you approach things. It can make a massive difference. Mm. Awesome. One of the things I, uh, I saw somewhere, maybe one of the courses you were doing was around elevator pitches, mm. um, which I, I believe you're quite passionate about. What do you think should be in an elevator pitch? And do you, I was going to ask you to do models one for us. I don't know if that's still <laughs> relevant. But. Oh, model, I, I worked um, on the elevator pitch just before I, I did the course, and it was, it was going to be something around, like, it's the place where smart, interesting people gather to talk about important things. Um, uh, so that sort of lost resonance with me. But, sure. but basically, it needs to be something that, I'm not an expert at, at elevators, but it needs to be something that just really captures people's imagination. So they're like, I want to learn more. Um, that's really interesting. It doesn't need to perfectly describe your startup. It, there just needs to be a hook um, and uh, to sort of really ask, so that the person listening just asks the next question. They want to learn more. Great. Do you have any advice for people who are pitching for funding? And how involved were you in that process when, when that was happening? Yeah, I mean, we were involved. Uh, Michael really took the lead. He's the genius that knows how to raise lots and lots of money. Um, I think the key is good storytelling. And uh, because investors are really, you know, there's not a lot of traction often uh, to go on. I guess, I guess one tip is have really good traction and be able to talk about that, know all the numbers in your business. That's a, that's a given, you've got to be able to do that. But being really good at storytelling is really important. So. Um, you may even want to write out the story of your business and sort of interesting facts and what's what's unique about it. You know, what would you tell someone at a cocktail party that would sort of get their attention? And we were just we were just really good at that. So I think um, we've just learned over many years like how to tell a story, how to how to fascinate people, and that's just really important. Have you heard any other really awesome pictures that stand out in your mind? Uh, awesome pictures. Um, so there's a. There's a really good video uh, that Fernod Kosler uh, does it's on the internet. It says, pitch the way VCs think. If you, if you type that into Google, you'll find it. And it's just a lot of practical advice. And unfortunately, he has really bad slides, because uh, he's talking about how to do your slides and how to, how to talk with emotion. Um, but that would be a resource I would, I would look at if you're doing pitching is um, something like that. I think trying to simplify your message down to a really sort of very clear value proposition is, is important. <coughs> Um, not to get too complicated. And also to think about, think through, and this is what he says in the video, is to think through um, what the investor is thinking. You know, what, what are the, the things that are going through their minds? So they might be thinking, wow, this is really risky, or I wouldn't use this personally. Um, so like one trick we would do is we would send um, all of the uh, secretaries free shoes of pay shoes before we would arrive so that they would design the shoe weeks in advance. And then have, uh, we'd time it so the shoes would get there when the pitch was going to happen, and hopefully they love the shoes. And if they did, then that sort of showed predominantly male investors that, like, hey, we were into something. Yeah, great tip. Mm. Let me just refer to a few questions here that we're getting as well. Um, I've got a few questions around team and culture. So what was the culture like at Shoes of Prey? And um, I guess how do you form that and how, what were the lessons you learned? Uh, so we learned a lot of this from Google, um, and some people described the, the culture at Shoes of Prey affectionately as a cult, uh, which is kind of what you're aiming for as a startup founder. Uh, you want people to really enjoy working, going you know, turning up to work every day. Um, so you know, a really simple thing is we gave everyone free lunch, and we did that pretty much from the beginning of the business, even though we were often paying for it ourselves out of our own pocket. Um, because we just knew that that creates a real sort of family, family environment. If everyone's eating together and they don't have to pay for their own meal, um, and we would buy really good food, like we wouldn't skimp and get like, you know, catering. We would actually go to a restaurant and get, you know, spend a bit more money. Um, you know, that, that's just a great way to sort of build 
uh, it's not about the food, it's about the conversation and, and, and really caring for each other as, as, as humans and individuals. Um, we actually created a document about our culture early on to explain what the culture should be. And we sort of got a lot of inspiration from Netflix's culture guide. Um, and you can find that on the internet, but um, actually outlining what your culture is, you know, what's allowed, what's appropriate behavior, what's not appropriate behavior, you know, what are the expectations? What are we, what's our goal? Like, is our goal to make the customers happy? Is that the number one goal? Which it is that she's a prey. So that, that becomes then um, a litmus test for a lot of things that happen in the company. So you just know, you know, this is what the, the goal should be. A really simple example is at Google, they used to say, you know, don't be evil. So if you're in a meeting and someone was like, oh, we could charge the advertisers, you know, a secret fee and da 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 da, someone would say, don't be evil. And it's like, that's end of discussion. Yeah, great. You mentioned earlier that it's important to hire the very best people. Um, how do you decide where to cut corners due to early stage startup cash flow? Like, at what point can you work so around that? You don't want to cut corners ever. What you want to do is get really good at explaining what your vision is and why people should come and work for you for a lot less. That's the answer. You want, you want someone who's currently getting, you know, $250,000 to come and work for 50 grand because you're just awesome at telling a story and saying, we're going to help you because you want to learn about marketing. You're, we're going to help you learn about marketing and we're going to change the, the course of history because we're going to do something that's like so wild and out there and you're going to feel so proud of being part of this team. Like that's, that's kind of the message you want to convey. Did you have success in doing that early on with Shoes of Prey? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah we, uh, I think um, like a really simple example is all of our software engineers, um, the way I got all of them, they're all incredible. They could all go and work for Google or Microsoft. Um, I went to UNSW because we're in Sydney and I gave a talk about what it was like to be a software engineer at Google. And I got the whole grade coming to listen. And then I said, hey, if you, any of you want to work with me at the end, like uh, this, this holidays, I'm going to pay uh, an internship, or two internship places, and I had the best two students, ones that went on to get university medals, come and work with me. And then um, one of them still works for us today, six years later in, in Los Angeles. And then um, they hired kind of all their friends who are also great students to come and work. Um, and because I was giving them so much freedom and responsibility, I could say like, it's going to be so different to going to Google where you'll be a tiny cog in a massive wheel. Like I'm going to teach you all the stuff that you would have done there plus a whole bunch more and you're going to get to run the show from day one. It's very impressive that you can compete with Google on, uh, on the employment front. Mm. <laughs> That's great. Would you ever go back to working at Google? Yeah, definitely. It's a, great, it's a great place. And I think if you're just at the beginning of your entrepreneurial journey and you're wondering what to do, I think going to work for someone like that um, would be a really good move because you just learn so much about how a big business is constructed and how it's managed and you know if you're really observant you can learn a lot of stuff just from osmosis um, and also meet a whole bunch of really interesting people and really clever people that then later in your career you know are very very helpful um, yeah awesome if you could work for any company now who would that be uh, anything that Elon Musk is doing I think I'd definitely uh, want to work for him. Actually, one tip is, you know, when you hire people, particularly the first people in your business, you want to hire people that you yourself would want to go and work for. It's a really good tip. So ideally, you know, uh, it's not particularly related to your question, but it sort of reminded me, like, ideally you're hiring people into your own startup that you want to go and work for, because uh, that's sort of how you're going to improve. Yeah, nice tip. Back on the, uh, the founders and the startup scene, have you noticed any key ingredients? Like are there three key ingredients that you would say a founder should really have to be operating in this space? Because I think you know something that's increasingly coming up now is that unlike when you started, being an entrepreneur is now quite cool. And I think a lot of people are starting because they think that it's a cool thing to do. Yep. So how can people kind of really stop and have a look at themselves and say, well, am I actually cut out for this? Yep. And what traits might they need? So I think the number one trait is courage. Uh, because it's very, very hard. Uh, the number two, actually this is not really in order, but the number two would be um, communication skills. It's really, as a founder, that's all you're doing is communicate, communicating with people. And then um, as a sub-bullet, I would put listening in that. 
Uh, Just in case. Yeah. yeah. Okay. <laughs> Spell it out. Yeah. And then number three would be self-awareness as well, because um, it's easy to be the founder and you think that you've got to have all the answers and you, you go into a meeting and you bark orders at everyone and everyone's just like, ugh, this is, this is not good, right? So being able to actually engage with the team of wonderful people you've just hired and you know, get them to sort of come with you on the journey that's really hard. That took sort of years to sort of realize that that was a problem. And I, I still haven't fully worked out how to implement that for myself. But um, yeah, there's a whole, I mean, that's the cool thing about being a founder is that there's so much growth and learning opportunity mm. in a startup. It's just infinite. You can, you can go from not knowing anything about business or management to being, you know, incredibly good at not just managing a team, but running complex projects and, you know, doing all these kinds of amazing things. And so, it's really like a, a, a practical MBA in many ways. Nice. Now I have a few last questions left and uh, these ones have been inspired by Tim Ferriss. Um, a little bit different to what I normally bring out at the end, but I thought, why not? So what are your tips for staying focused? Oh, good one. Um, I have, I, I use Brain FM, uh, which is uh, AI created uh, concentration music. Um, I've been turning off all the notifications from my phone and trying to unsubscribe from every email. Um, I'm trying to only look at email once a day, but that's really hard. <laughs> um, yeah, so just trying to, I think, quiet the noise. I'm also, um, I recently got into meditation in the last uh, 18 months. That's been really helpful. Uh, and exercise as well. I forgot to exercise for most of the early parts <laughs> of Choose a Prey. Um, for those, what, eight years? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Fair enough. What does, um, well actually this might come into my next question. Do you have a morning routine or something you use to start the day? Uh, we go to the gym and yeah, and then, no, and then sort of try to get, I, I need to get better at this actually. Yeah, there needs to be a bit more structure. I think it's really easy, and this is the trap I think everyone falls into, to know the theory of what you're supposed to do and then just totally fail to apply it to your own situation. Um, and that's so, I ran this course in Sydney and I think what I was teaching was not revolutionary. Like it's like everyone, you could go find the information on the internet, but it was actually, what was useful about it was like helping people apply it to the mm. situation going, oh, hang on, you're not really doing that. Um, so it's often easier to see mistakes in other people's businesses than it is to see it in your own. So I guess the tip is go and find someone who's really good at giving critical feedback and, and give you a lot of critical feedback. I need that myself. If you're good at that, let me know. <laughs> well, it's great <laughs> advice because I think a lot of the stuff we talk about, we go, yeah, that, that makes sense. We can all see why that would be beneficial, but doing it is a different matter, isn't it? Yeah. So I totally understand. So you had mentioned before you were getting into meditating. That's not part of your morning routine. When and how do you use that? And do you have any tips for someone else going, I've heard a lot about meditating, I want to try it? Yeah. Uh, I try to do it sometimes in the morning. I try to do it twice a day. I, I watched a really good thing um, by Jerry Seinfeld where he talks about transcendental meditation. It's on YouTube. Um, I'm using the Oak app, which is um, a new one that's just come out by Kevin Rose, I think. Um, and that's really good. You can um, set your, your time and you can, set, you can sort of customize the soundscape and it's, it's really great. Um, yeah, I'm not, I'm not the best meditator, but I, it is really helpful um, uh, to do. Awesome, I'm mm. taking notes because I'm gonna be writing an article after this. Oh, good. Um, how do you set performance targets for yourself? Like, or how have you in the past? What would you recommend? Um, I think we were good at doing that at She's a Prey. I'm not very good at doing that for myself. I think that's the one thing I've learned is I need a team to actually give some structure to myself uh, more, than, more than anything. So I think I've, I'd give myself uh, an F at doing that this year. <laughs> um, but at least I think I've realized that the problem is I need to be around people again. So mm. yeah, watch this space. Awesome. Yeah. And do you have any top tips for work-life balance? Um, I think what really helped us at Choose a Prey is once we got good at managing the company, and so being really clear about what the vision was, what the culture was, what we were working on this quarter, what we weren't working on this quarter, who was doing what, who was making decisions. When you get all that structure around you, you can actually work nine to five and take weekends off and go on holidays because it's just, you're managing the business correctly. Whereas if it's just a, um, I like to call it idea whiplash, 
where you know every every week you come in with a new idea and and that like there's no structure and there's no no one's really running the process. It's not a professional company. That's when you get out of whack with your work life balance because there's no plan. You're just kind of running around with your like your heads chopped chopped off like a, a chicken. Does anyone here think they maybe chase shiny new things a bit too much? Anyone in the room? Only a few. Wow. You're all much I'm, better than I'm, that. I'm doubtful that's true. <laughs> <laughs> well, look, we did have a few final questions, but hopefully you'll be able to stay around for a few minutes afterwards and catch up with anyone whose question I didn't get to tonight. Thank you so much for joining us. I really appreciate it. My pleasure. Thanks, Louisa. And uh, I'd really like to invite you all to stand in the Startup Growing Way. And thanks, Mike, for joining us. A round of applause. <laughs> we have a small token of our appreciation. Thank you. Thank you.